So, shall we continue? Uh, are you ready? Yeah, okay, good. I'm glad you are so excited and keen and eager. That's right. <laughs> Great. Okay, so um, we have just been uh, looking at the Buddha's thinking or the Buddha to be's thinking before he decides to go forth. And of course, the next thing that happens here is the Buddha's going forth where he gives up the home life and that becomes like the right intention, the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, Samma Sankappa uh, can also be translated as right purpose, uh, right aim, right intention is where you are going, is your aim, your purpose, what you want to do next. Uh, and then of course after that uh, then comes the, uh, uh, in this particular sutta he then goes directly to uh, the spiritual teachers and practices meditation practice uh, and that could be similar maybe to Samma Sati, maybe Samma Samadhi as well. Uh, but in some of the parallel versions of these suttas he actually first he, he practices purity and that practice of purity uh, is obviously an equivalent to the other factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, Samma Vacha, Samma Kamanta, Samma Ajiva, where you purify yourself uh, yeah, in morality, and then Samma Vayama or Samma Padana, which is right effort, uh, which is like the mental purification. So that is kind of included there as well. I'm just showing you how the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path kind of fits in with the Buddha's own uh, going forth and his striving towards awakening. And then Ultimately, just before his awakening, he practices Samma Samadhi again when he goes into the jhana states fully. Yeah. But the Buddha makes a few detours, yeah, because he doesn't really know what he is doing. He, does, he hasn't been given a path. He has to find this path for himself. And this is what is so impressive with the Buddha to be, is that he is able to find the path for himself. Most of us, you know, we are given the path on a plate and says, do this, and still we can't do it. But, yeah, you, you know what I mean? It's quite, quite hard sometimes to do these things, and yet here is someone, he doesn't even have the path, and still he's able to find it. And that is what is so impressive with uh, the Buddha and his wisdom and all of that. Uh, so let us see what this says next. I have put a little short passage from Majjhima Nikaya 85, Bodhiraja Kumara Sutta. I, I gave the name wrongly yesterday. I, I, my mind was getting a bit kind of uh, dodgy, dodgy towards the end. So uh, uh, but that's where it is from. I really, I put this in the wrong place. Really, I realized that I should probably come later on. Uh, as, but anyway, let's just read it quickly. This is what I mentioned yesterday, and where. The prince, a Bodhi uh, Raja Kumara, he says to the Buddha that, oh, you know, pleasure is to be gained through pain. Uh, and then the Buddha replies, Prince, before my awakening, uh, while I was still only an unawakened Bodhisatta, I too thought thus, pleasure is not to be gained through pleasure. Pleasure is to be gained through pain. And then after that, the Buddha tells him the story of his own awakening, which is pretty much the same story we are reading from now on. And then he shows him how the pleasure of the path, especially the pleasures of the jhanas, actually they are what give rise to awakening for the Buddha. And these are kind of essential parts of the path. So uh, this is a misunderstanding, it's a wrong view. I too thought this, in other words, I too had, I had wrong view in a sense, if you like, before my awakening, uh, which is kind of obvious. Uh. So that is, a, I think, an important little paragraph and an important little passage to keep in mind. And then we can continue uh, with the story of Majjhima Nikaya 26. And this is what happens next. Uh. Later, while still young, a black-haired young man endowed with the blessing of youth in the prime of life, though my mother and father wished otherwise and wept with tearful faces, I shaved off my hair and beard, put on the ochre robes and went forth from home life into homelessness. And there's another small little passage which is very interesting. And uh, this is where we start to see the difference between the later legend of the Buddha and the early suttas. According to the later legend of the Buddha, uh, you, the Buddha is supposed to have left in the middle of the night while his wife and child were sleeping. Uh, and then and he gets on the horse Kantaka, the horse Kantaka, and he rides out of this magnificent capital city called Pat Kaplavatu and jumps over the large city walls. Uh, and then, you know, and <laughs> sounds like some kind of movie from Hollywood or something. Uh, and, the, and then he, um, 
uh, it goes off and then it shaves off his head in the forest somewhere and we have the story there. And it shows us the, the danger sometimes of relying on these stories because uh, from that the Buddha seems almost a bit irresponsible. Yeah, He just kind of leaves his wife and child behind, just kind of flees on the, in the middle of the night. It does sound a bit strange. And um, uh, one of the things, I, I know this, I've, I've been told this, in, you know, there are Christians, they like to be missionaries and like to convert other people to Christianity. <laughs> and you find this in many places around the Buddhist world, they want to convert all the Buddhists to, to become Christians, because otherwise the Buddhists are going to be in trouble, yeah, if they don't become Christians. Uh, that's, what the, that's what they say. And so they go to places like Sri Lanka, uh, where there are lots of Buddhists, and many of these Buddhists are not very well educated. They don't really know much about Buddhism, yeah. So when then the Christians come and say, oh, you know, your Buddha, he's irresponsible, he just leaves his wife and child at home like that, that's irresponsible, can't do that, yeah, that's, that's really bad. And the village think, oh yeah, that's true, yeah, that's the story of the, you know, that's what happened, maybe you're right, yeah, maybe the Buddha was irresponsible. But actually, it is not even true, that's not actually what happened. What happened is this, that he, he, he his mother and father wished otherwise, which obviously means that he has spoken with his parents. Uh, he had talked to them, he, and if he has talked to his parents, then presumably he would also have talked to his wife and child. Actually, there's no mention of a wife anywhere in the sutta, so you, you wonder exactly what is going on. But, uh, uh, so his parents probably was the main thing. And uh, so he had organized these things. We can be almost absolutely sure that his child would be taken care of, otherwise he wouldn't be able to go forth. Uh, yeah, and uh, so it's a very different situation from what you actually find in the later mythology. And this is one of the reasons why it is so important to distinguish between the later legends and the later myth uh, and compare that to the uh, earliest texts, because the picture that arises can often be quite different. Uh, and this is just one tiny little point, but actually it, uh, it, it, it can matter quite significantly. So the Buddha was, as we would expect, he was responsible. Uh, yeah, he made sure that people were looked after. Uh, he just didn't ride off in the middle of the night. But I guess as Buddhists we would still probably forgive him, yeah, even if he rode off in the middle of the night. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because he has kind of given us Buddhism, yeah? so we say, okay. Yeah. <laughs> But, but even that turns out to not be necessary, yeah. so uh, it is kind of, kind of nice. Um, and then it's kind of nice that his mother and father wished otherwise and they wept with tearful faces. Uh, does that kind of ring a bell? It's like everyone today, yeah? If your son or daughter, especially your son, says that, you know, oh, I'm going to go forth, no, don't go forth, please, that's the last thing we want. That's what happened to my parents. Uh, they didn't want me to go forth and become a monk at all. Uh, why? Well, because they didn't have a clue about Buddhism, that's why. If they had understood Buddhism, they would have said, please, go, go quickly. <laughs> yeah, you know, now is the time. They would have encouraged me from when I was young. Yeah. But the reason why people are reticent is because they don't understand. If they understood that this is the meaning of life, this is what it's all about, of course they would encourage you to go forth. Uh, and then later on, when you start to gain some of your personal insight into these teachings, uh, you can become such a blessing for the world around you as well. Uh, you gain the most happiness for yourself and you can support others at the same time. What better can you possibly do in this world uh, instead of kind of experiencing all the same suffering as everyone else? That's, that is what is pointless. Let's face it, that is what is silly, and uh, uh, you know, that is what the problem arises. So sometimes you find pa parents who are quite enlightened and quite wise, and they actually do encourage their children to go forth when they want to go forth. And that is a, is a very wonderful thing. We have a, a young man from Penang uh, staying with us at Bodhinana Monastery. Some of you may have met him. His name used to be CC. Yeah, now he's been a Bujayako. He's a very, very, ni very, very nice fellow. And uh, his mother was very happy when he decided to go forth, uh, but she had been going to Ajahn Brahm retreats for a long time, so she was probably brainwashed <laughs> by Ajahn Brahm. Uh, his father was a bit more, he was not quite so happy, yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> so again, some people are more kind of in tune with the Dhamma, whereas others are, are not so much. And that's usually the reason why parents are reticent is because they don't really understand what the Dhamma is about. Uh, they think that Dhamma, Dhamma is for kind of the, if you have a really stupid child who cannot do anything in life, that, that is when they become monastics. <laughs> and it's a bit like that in, around the world, in Buddhist countries as well, okay, if you are really smart, you go to university, you become something big, uh, 
But uh, if, if you're really kind of silly and you have no future, okay, then you go to the monastery here. <laughs> but actually, it should be the other way around. Yeah, that's the reality of it. Uh, it's a misunderstanding of what is going on here. So uh, we need to educate people more about happiness. And once people understand that this is the meaning of life, then there is obviously no doubt anymore what is the right thing to do. Uh, so, uh, anyway, nothing has really changed uh, yeah, from those days. Uh, things are still the same. Uh, and then he shaves off his hair and beard, put on the ochre robe, the cassava color. It, yellow is, you know, it, it was not yellow, that's for sure. Uh, so it was ochre, it, was kind of a it could be a variety of colors depending on the kind of dye they used. Uh, orange, uh, maybe, uh, maybe, sometimes maybe, maybe it's a little bit orange perhaps. Uh, but uh, so it was, there were natural dyes, so a bit like the natural dyes you use in Thailand, like a jackfruit dye, uh, which is, gives a kind of greenish brown color. This is not natural dye, this is kind of chemical dye, so this is a different thing. Uh, but um, uh, and a, a, a range of colors that were acceptable. Uh, so the Buddha was a monk. Yeah. Sometimes people say the Buddha was not a monk. They say he was. He was a. Uh, uh, and there is a pas strange passage in the Diga Nikaya where the Buddha is said to look like the people around him. Uh, yeah. So it just sounds like he wasn't a monk, which is kind of weird. But here it is pretty obvious he was a monk. He shaves off his hair and puts on the ochre robe. And there are many passages in the suttas that make it very clear that the Buddha just looked like any of the other monks. Uh, so he wasn't any different from that. Uh, so good to. Sometimes you hear some strange theories and uh, and uh, it's there's endless the amount of strange theories you have to kind of deal with. Uh, and uh, sometimes you just don't want to deal with them anymore, and you just kind of say whatever. Uh, and uh, <laughs> anyway, so. Uh, he then goes forth, uh, and then uh, when he goes forth, the following happens uh, afterwards. Uh. Having gone forth, because in search of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace. Uh, what, what is that in Pali? Uh, way in here. <laughs> Have you got that there? <laughs> The supreme state of sublime peace, it's something Santipadanga. Santivada Padanga. Santivada. But it's supreme. Anuttaranga. Anuttaranga. Okay, so the, uns, the supreme state of, of sublime peace. Okay. Um, I went to Alara Kalama and said to him, Friend Kalama, I want to lead the holy life in this Dhamma and uh, training. I, thought I prefer training to discipline her, because uh, vinaya, uh, the meaning really is training of that word, and later on it becomes the uh, vinaya pitaka, which is the, all the rules and regulations for monastics, uh, but it means like training really in the su early suttas. So. so he goes to Alara Kalama, Kalama is an interesting name, Kalama is like the Kalama Sutta, so quite likely he belonged, he came from that clan of people, the Kalamas, quite likely. That's why he's called Kalama. Just like uh, the Buddha is called Gotama. Gotama would have been the, uh, uh, the Gotama clan, the Sakyans, yeah, they were Gotamas. Uh, and uh, each, of, each town kind of had their clan names. Uh, the um, Kushin, people of Kushinara were called Vasettas. Uh, that was their family name, and Vasetta is a, is a name we find in the suttas in various places. Uh. So he goes to Alara Kalama. And he wants to lead the brahmacharya in this Dhamma and teaching. This is the Dhamma and Vinaya. And Lara Kalama replied, um, and you can, in a sense, you can know right here that, that the Vinaya does not mean discipline in the ordinary sense of rules and regulations, because here he was just going to this spiritual teacher. Uh, yeah, there wasn't any Vinaya in particular there. I, I guess there were some rules, there's always some rules in the community, but it was not Vinaya in the sense that we know later. Uh, so it's more likely to mean Dhamma. Dhamma is the doctrine, Vinaya is the training. It's like the theory and praxis, if you like. Uh, the Dhamma is the theory that this the, the vinaya is the practice that you pursue consequent upon that theory. Yeah. Alara Kalama replied, the venerable one may stay here. This Dhamma is such that the wise man uh, can enter upon and abide in it, uh, realizing for himself through direct knowledge his own teacher's doctrine. Uh, 
I soon quickly learned that Dhamma, as far as mere lip reciting and rehearsal of his teaching went, I could speak with knowledge and assurance, and I claimed I know and see, and there were others who did likewise. So as always, every teaching has a some, some kind of framework, yeah, some kind of doctrine that kind of tells you about that teaching. There's, there's very, it's impossible to have a, teach, uh, a, a spiritual life without some kind of doctrine because it has to have a framework in, in which to make sense of it. And this is obviously true here as well. So there is a, a theory, some degree of theory there. Here. In the parallel in the Chinese, translation of this, it doesn't say anything about uh, the doctrine, uh, but I think we can take it as given that there always has to be some degree of doctrine, otherwise uh, it wouldn't really make any sense, I think. Uh, I considered it is not through mere faith alone that Alara Kalama declares, uh, by realizing for myself with direct knowledge, I enter upon and abide in this Dhamma. Certainly Alara Kalama abides knowing and seeing this Dhamma. Then I went to Alara Kalama and asked him, Friend Kalama, in what way do you declare that by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma? Uh, in reply, he declared the base of nothingness, uh, the Akinsha Ayatana. Uh, so uh, this is what he is supposed to have attained, yeah, Alara Kalama, the base of nothingness, or base is a strange word, uh, maybe the plane of nothingness, or the uh, uh, yeah, maybe the plane or the uh, sphere, perhaps, of nothingness, or the level, I, I'm not sure, but plane maybe might be nice because you can think of the various meditating attainments as different planes. And ayatana literally means a stretching out, it means like a, a, you know, a, a, an area, if you like, uh, the area of nothingness. And uh, when you read that, straight away you think that this must be a reference to the uh, immaterial attainments. On the Buddhist path you have the four jhanas, which are samma samadhi. If you don't understand some of the words I use, please, please feel free to ask at any time. The microphone is there, you're more than welcome to, to stop me and say, I don't understand anything, please explain from the beginning. No. <laughs> no please, please don't say that, because that will be take too much time, but you know, something like that. <laughs> So you have the last factor of the Noble Eightfold Path is the four jhanas, yeah, the samma, samadhi. And then beyond those four jhanas you have four other uh, attainments in samadhi that are even more profound than the four jhanas. And they are called the four immaterial attainments. They're not called jhanas, often they're called jhanas, like the eight jhanas, but actually they're not called that in the suttas. And that is an important distinction. Yeah, sometimes we think, yeah, we can just call it the eight jhanas, or sometimes you have even the ninth jhana, the cessation of perception and feeling at the very end. But actually it is important that we keep the right names, because uh, uh, if you don't keep the right names, sometimes things get confused. People will say that the jhanas are sama samadhi, but if you make the immaterial attainments into the another four jhanas, then suddenly you expand the idea of sama samadhi. Yeah, so you get very easily get confused, but actually Samma Samadhi is only the four jhanas, one, two, three, four, and not the rest of it. Uh, that's kind of an important point. Uh. So, um, uh, he declares this base of nothingness. So is that base of nothingness, is it the same as one of the immaterial attainments, or is it not? Uh, and uh, I, th I, th I think an argument can be made that it is not the same. Many people would say it is the same. Uh, but uh, does it matter? And uh, it may perhaps matter a little bit because, uh, uh, and the reason why it may matter a little bit is because later on the Buddha, when he is about to attain his enlightenment, he uh, remembers back. And he remembers back when he was a young boy and he attained the first jhana under the rose apple tree. And then he knows that this is the path to awakening. And many people have asked, well, why does he remember all the way back to who was a boy when he attained these profound states already, uh, when he was, uh, uh, after he went forth? And uh, there are many possible answers to that question, and one possible answer is that these were not the full attainments, there was something lesser than uh, the immaterial attainments. Anyway, it's all a bit theoretical, and it doesn't really matter so much for the understanding of the path, it actually doesn't, it's not really uh, very relevant. So we will just leave that discussion aside, and if you want to ask about it later on, you, you can, you can please do so. Huh? So, 
he declared the plane of nothingness, a very, very profound state of samadhi. And I considered not only Alara Kalama has faith, energy, mindfulness, stillness and wisdom, I too have faith, energy, mindfulness, stillness and wisdom. Suppose I endeavor to realize the Dhamma that Alara Kalama declares. He enters upon and abides in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. So here you see these factors, yeah, the faith, energy, mindfulness, stillness and wisdom. And you probably, some of you will recognize that as the five faculties, the Panch Indriya that you find in the suttas. And uh, in a sense it is a little bit strange that the five faculties should occur here because uh, uh, the five faculties are qualities that only uh, later on only the noble ones have. He is not the Buddha yet, he is not yet a noble person, and certainly Alara Kalama is not a noble person. So really, they shouldn't really have these five, five faculties. So here it must mean something a little bit different. And in fact, the uh, Chinese parallel to this sutta in the uh, uh, Madhyama Agama does not have the five faculties in this place, which kind of makes sense. Yeah? Instead it has faith, energy and wisdom. It leaves out mindfulness and stillness. And maybe that is more original, maybe that is more appropriate because it does not seem quite right that someone who is not a noble one should have the five faculties. So again, this is interesting. It's just uh, little things that you can see by comparing the suttas. Yeah? And uh, I don't know, it may not mean all that much to you, uh, but uh, because I've been studying this for so long, that for me it's kind of exciting when I see this. I get really excited. Look at this. Wow, that's really cool. Uh, yeah? <laughs> you see these little things that kind of fit, make the puzzle kind of fit better together than it otherwise might. So uh, the Buddha. Yeah, the Buddha knows that he also has the same qualities. The Buddha is uh, confident in his own abilities. So please realize that, that is a, it's okay to be confident, not in an egotistical, egotistical sense, but in a sense of just knowing that uh, uh, we all have the ability to reach these things. Uh. So then he says, I soon entered upon and abided in that Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. Uh, then I went to Alara Kalama and asked him, Friend Kalama, is it in this way that you declare that you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge? That is the way, friend. And then the Buddha-to-be says, It is in this way, friend, that I also now abide in this Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. And Alara Kalama replies, it is a gain for us, friend, it is a great gain for us that we have such a venerable one for our companion in the holy life. Isn't that wonderful? Beautiful, isn't it? Someone has, a, someone has some success in the Dhamma, I think, wow, what a wonderful thing that we have success in the Dhamma, wow, now we have such a wonderful friend who is you know, living well and having success, what a great thing that is. And uh, this is how, this is the right way of rejoicing when someone else is having success. Uh, sometimes people get jealous, uh, but that is obviously the wrong way. Uh, and this is the right way of, uh, of rejoicing. It's very, very nice the way this is done. Uh, so, and then he says, so the Dhamma I declare and I enter upon and abide in by realizing for myself with direct knowledge is a Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in uh, by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge. Uh, and the Dhamma that you enter upon the body by realizing for yourself direct knowledge is the Dhamma that I declare about him by realizing for myself direct knowledge. I'm reading it fast because it's just very repetitive. Eh? So you know the Dhamma that I know and I know the Dhamma that you know. <laughs> As I am, so are you. As you are, so am I. He's really getting into it there. <laughs> uh, and then he says, come friend, let us now lead this community together. It's very, uh, it's uh, very nice, yeah, very and very interesting and very kind of uh, little details that are very touching because obviously he was a very wise person to react in such a way. Yeah, now let us lead the community together. He didn't have much pride. There wasn't much ego there or anything like that, uh, and he was a very open person. Uh, and so, in, in some ways, very impressive. So we know later on, after the Buddha reaches his awakening, uh, he says, who should I first teach the Dhamma to? The first pe person he thinks of is Alara Kalama, because he realized Alara Kalama must have been very close to awakening. He was already very wise. Uh, he had a very good attitude about things. Uh, and you see that right here. 
So he says, let us lead this community together. And uh, uh, many people would say, yes, they would take the opportunity yeah, to lead the community together. But uh, the Buddha-to-be is different. So he says the following, Thus, Alara Kalama, my teacher, placed me, his pupil, on an equal footing with himself and awarded me the highest honor. But it occurred to me, this Dhamma does not lead to uh, aver aversion or, or um, aversion or a repulsion, perhaps. Yeah, I, d I don't like this enchantment, that's why I'm, I'm not reading it. I, I refuse to read that word. <coughs> aversion, uh, repulsion, or something like that. Because it is a st quite a strong quality, yeah, this, uh, this idea of having enough of the world. Oh, I don't want to see it anymore. No, this is dukkha. This is the point, you turn in a different direction. This enchantment is too weak. It's a strong turning, a turning away from the problems of the world. You can use the word disenchantment, it is less confrontational than some of these other words, uh, but it, probably it um, is a strong kind of emotion. To dispassion, you lose interest, uh, to cessation, to peace, uh, to direct insight, to awakening and to extinguishment, uh, but only to the reappearance in the plane of nothingness. This is where it leads to, it doesn't lead to these other things. Uh, not being satisfied with this Dhamma, disappointed with it, uh, I left. So it's kind of interesting. He's not the Buddha yet. Yeah, he doesn't really know what he's looking for. He's looking for the ending of death, really, the ending of dukkha. Uh, and he somehow he knows that this is not the ending of it. Somehow he has this feeling that uh, this is not quite right. The vocabulary that he uses here, that it doesn't lead to aversion, dispassion, cessation. This is really, he probably didn't think these words at the time, but this is kind of the vocabulary that he uses later on, after he becomes a Buddha. And now he's also using it here to explain roughly how he felt at the time. Yeah? But he probably didn't have exactly those thoughts. I think it's unlikely because he didn't really know what Nibbana was yet. He didn't know anything about awakening. He didn't even know if it was possible. Yeah? He was still fumbling around in the dark. So he couldn't really have used those words because they, they were meaningless to him at this point. So this is more like a, a later interpretation of what happened at that point. So he left, yeah, at this point he left and he allowed Kal Alara Kalama to continue leading that community. Now one of the little things I was saying before that uh, Alara Kalama, I, maybe he didn't reach those profound immaterial attainments, uh, and one of the little clues to that is a, a passage in the uh, a Mahaparinibbana Sutta, and in that Sutta there is a, a disciple of Alara Kalama, he goes to the Buddha and he says to the Buddha that uh, Alara Kalama, he had such profound meditation uh, that when he was sitting down, uh, even what, though there were 500 carts uh, g passing by, uh, and they were passing by so closely that he was spatted with dust and, and dust when they were coming by, he was just sitting there and he didn't he even hear those carts. Uh, yeah? And uh, so what does that mean? And what it means is that uh, it, it, he would have been sitting in a state of samadhi, but you know, the first jhana is enough for that. Uh, yeah? In fact, it doesn't necessarily even have to be the first jhana. It can be a profound state of samadhi even prior to that, where you don't hear very much at all. Uh, and you may not be been aware of those 500 cards, uh, but possibly the first jhana. And that uh, uh, points to a direction, to, to maybe the fact that he didn't actually reach those immaterial attainments. Anyway, I am getting a bit sidetracked here, but just uh, to show you how you can use different suttas to, uh, uh, to kind of uh, throw light upon each other in this way here. Okay, still in search because of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I went to Uddhaka Ramaputta and said to him, yeah, this is the same Uddhaka Ramaputta we saw on the first day, the one who says that uh, I see I see, but do not see her. Um, friend, I want to lead the holy life in this Dhamma and training here. Uddhaka Ramaputta replied, the Venerable One may stay here. This Dhamma is such that a wise man can enter upon and abide in it, himself realizing through direct knowledge his own teacher's doctrine. 
I soon learned that Dhamma, as far as mere lip reciting and rehearsal of his teaching went, I could speak with knowledge and assurance, and I claimed I know and see. And there were others who did likewise. So there was like a community here. I considered it was not through mere faith alone that Rama declared, by realizing for myself with direct knowledge, I enter upon and abide in this Dhamma. Now, I just want to point out one little thing there, which uh, may not be obvious when you see this for the first time. Yeah, we have just been talking about Uddaka Ramaputta, but now he's talking about Rama. So what is the connection between Rama and Uddaka Ramaputta? And uh, the connection, presumably, is Ramaputta literally means uh, son of Rama. Yeah, and the um, uh, Sakya and all the monastics and the lay people who were followers of the Buddha, they're called Sakya, Sakya Putta, yeah, the sons of the Sakya. Uh. So Ramaputta here, quite, quite possibly, uh, quite likely even, means the spiritual son or the spiritual heir of Rama. So Uddaka, he was the spiritual son or spiritual heir of Rama, whereas Rama was really the real teacher. And it was Rama that who had attained these profound states of meditation, not Uddaka. And uh, it's quite interesting, why is there, wh 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 what is this detail all about? What is the point of this? Uh, yeah, if this sutta was constructed artificially, if this sutta was a consequence of maybe stories being shared in India or something like that, then this whole seems to be pointless, this kind of little thing. This is like a, almost like a historical, little historical detail that seems to have been preserved over very long periods of time. Because otherwise it has no meaning in terms of Dhamma. It only has a meaning if it exists there as a hist real historical detail. This has been pointed out by scholars. And again, these little things like that, they kind of make the suttas more real, they make them more like history, yeah, and the, the sense that actually this is the word of the Buddha that we have access to, because uh, otherwise uh, little things like that would be completely incomprehensible. Uh. So it's Rama who had this, in, not Uddaka Ramaputta, and this has consequences as we will see for the rest of the passage, because it, the rest of the passage reads almost exactly the same as for Alara Kalama, but tiny differences, and we will have a just brief look at that as we go through it. Uh. Uh, so, uh, certain, yeah, so I enter upon this Dhamma and discipline. Uh, certainly Rama abided knowing and seeing this Dhamma. Then I went to Uddhaka Ramaputta and asked him, friend, in what way did Rama declare by realizing for himself with direct knowledge and enter upon and abide in this Dhamma? In reply, Uddhaka Ramaputta declared the plane of neither perception nor non-perception, uh, which is usually the fourth of the immaterial attainments. Uh, I considered not only Rama had faith, energy, mindfulness, stillness and wisdom, I too have faith, energy, mindfulness, stillness and wisdom. Suppose I endeavored to realize the Dhamma that Rama declared. He entered upon and abided in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. Uh, I soon entered upon and abided in that Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. Then I went to Uddhaka Ramaputta and asked him, Friend, was it in this way that Rama declared that he entered upon and abided in this Dhamma by realizing for himself with direct knowledge? Wow, it's so repetitive. Yeah. <laughs> Poor. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing. That is the way, friend. It is in this way, friend, that I also abide, enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. And then Uddhakaramputta also says, it is a gain for us, friend, it is a great gain for us that we have such a venerable one for our companion in the holy life. So the Dhamma that Rama declared, he entered upon and abided in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, is the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge. And the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that Rama declared and he entered upon and abided in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. So you know the Dhamma that Rama knew, and Dhamma knew the Dhamma that you know. As Rama was, so are you. As you are, so was Rama. Come friend, now lead this community here. Yeah, so you can see that uh, 
instead of putting him on the same level, lead it together, he actually asks him to lead it. Because Rama, presumably, he is probably dead, yeah, that's why they talk about him in this way. And uh, Ramaputta, uh, Udakaramputta, does not have the same attainment. Uh, and that's why he asked the Buddha to be to actually lead the community. Uh, so, slight different from the previous one. Uh. Thus, Uddhaka Ramaputta, my companion in the holy life, placed me in the position of a teacher and accorded me the highest honor. Uh. But it occurred to me this Dhamma does not lead to uh, uh, disenchantment. Uh. Uh, whatever, uh, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to awakening, to extinguishment, uh, but only to reappearance in the plane of neither perception nor non-perception. Not being satisfied with that Dhamma, disappointed with it, uh, I left. The Buddha-to-be is not interested in just having the honor of becoming the teacher, he is not interested in becoming famous, Uddhakaramaputta was already quite famous, yeah? he, he, as we saw later on, he, he already had other disciples and he was well known in India. That's why he was quoted in the Pasadika Sutta at the very beginning. Uh, but the Buddha, that wasn't what the Buddha was out. So already the Buddha, he didn't really have much ego. Yeah? He, he saw through the problems of ego already and he was really out there to find a real problem to the uh, uh, to the problem of existence and problem of life. So very one-pointed, yeah, very clear, very determined about what he was looking for. Uh, and again, this is what makes the Buddha so powerful. And if, if we have time, we probably don't have time, I can't imagine we will have time, that's, that's all, there's always too little time on these things. Uh, but um, if we do have time uh, against all odds, uh, then uh, maybe we will have a look at the uh, uh, by a bear of a suit, a Majimanikaya number four, uh, and in there the Buddha says that if anyone has been born in this world who is not subject to delusion, uh, someone who sees black as black and white as white, uh, it is me that that should be said about. Uh, yeah, so the idea that he has this ability to not be deluded, and this is kind of what makes the Buddha so special. The ability to question everything, uh, not to kind of follow along. The Buddha really is a black sheep, yeah. He is the ultimate black sheep. He goes against everyone else. Uh, and he kind of rejects first society, and then he, re he rejects the contemporary teachers. Then he rejects asceticism until he is by himself, uh, yeah, completely by himself. So he is the ultimate black sheep, standing alone, being completely independent, doing his own thing. Uh, it's very difficult to be like that, to be so independent, yeah? uh, and not really caring what e anyone else says. Uh, and this is kind of the power of a Buddha to be, the ability to uh, see through all the delusion and all the problems and go his own way and then find the uh, solution to these problems. So. so now he has rejected all of those teachings and uh, now we come to the next stage of his search. And uh, I think it says in some other suttas that he didn't just t uh, stay with Alara Kalama and Uddhaka Ramputta, but that he also sought out some o other wanderers as well. That is some of the other parallel suttas. Uh, uh, so he may have uh, tried out uh, the existing teachings. And in a sense, this is one of those nice things as well in the suttas. It shows the Buddha to be this very undeluded person. And even though he has all these powerful spiritual qualities, uh, first of all, he goes to the existing teachers. Uh, he doesn't set out ho on his own from the very beginning, uh, but first of all, he learns from those teachers that are in existence. Uh, yeah? So again, it shows, he it, it doesn't have this kind of pride that I'm going to look after myself, I'm, I'm the best and whatever, like you, you see in the uh, Majima 123, when he gets born, yeah, according to that, he takes seven steps and says, I am the best. Uh, it's kind of strange, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> it, sounds very, it sounds a little bit conceited almost. I am the best, I am the foremost, this is my last birth. Uh, and then he kind of, it, it's all, it all sounds a bit over the top, and that's why I don't really, I don't really like that sutta all that much. Uh, and uh, it is a leg very legendary status. Uh, so now, so he, he, he actually goes to all these teachers, uh, takes this teaching as far as 
they, they are, yeah? And then when he realizes he has to go out on his own, only then does he go out on his own when he understands the limits of that. So there is a degree of humility about the Buddha. And uh, he, he has all the right qualities, basically. Uh, he's confident in his own abilities, but he's also humble at the same time. It's a kind of important combination to have. Uh. Still in search because of what is wholesome, uh, seeking the su supreme uh, state of sublime peace, I wandered by stages through the Magadan country until eventually I arrived at Uruvela at Sena Nigama. So this is Bodhgaya, yeah, what he has arrived now. This is uh, the ancient name for what is now known as Bodhgaya. There I saw an agreeable piece of ground, a delightful grove with a clear flowing river with pleasant smooth banks and a nearby village for arms resort. Sounds quite nice, doesn't it? Uh, sounds like some kind of uh, holiday place or something. Uh, uh, it even called the, it's even called an arms resort. The word resort these days is kind of used for a place where people go on holiday sometimes. Uh, so it's, I don't fully like that translation, but anyway, that's the translation that he's using there. But again, you see that uh, a beautiful piece of nature, yeah? Uh, and again, the idea that nature is calming and soothing and that it should be a place that is suitable for the middle path is almost what is coming out here. Actually, it doesn't fit entirely here because then he starts the, some ascetic practices afterwards, uh, but the ascetic practices that he does, they don't really have anything to do with uh, uh, torturing the body as such. The ascetic practice that the Buddha does is more like breath control and fasting. Of course, that too is torturing the body, but it's a bit different from torturing it uh, by external things. Uh, so it, is, it still has that kind of sense of the uh, middle way there a little bit, that nature is not really a danger. I consider this is an agreeable piece of ground. This is a delightful grove with a clear flowing river with pleasant smooth banks and a nearby is a village for arms uh, resort. This will serve for the striving of a clansman intent on striving. And I sat down there thinking, this will serve for striving. Uh, the striving is padana, I think, in Pali. Uh, yes. yes, thank you, thank you, Wayne. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can be my, my kind of, uh, what is it? Uh, I'm not sure. Kind of my supporter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Scribe. <laughs> That's really, that's really handy. Yeah. So whether I'm in Perth or I'm here, I get way in always kind of helps me with the Pali, which is very, very handy here, yeah. either via the internet or, or more directly here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so that is what the, so now comes the striving, and which obviously ends with enlightenment. Yeah, he's now in the right place. And, uh, but before he starts his uh, ascetic practices, uh, uh, there is another I important passage here which comes next. Uh, and this passage comes from the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, Majima 36, uh, the uh, discourse to Satchika. So, uh, uh, this is how this passage goes. Uh, and this is about the danger in sensuality or sensual pleasures. Uh. Now, these three similes occur to me spontaneously, never heard before. Suppose there were a wet, sappy piece of wood lying in water, and a man came with an upper fire stick thinking, I shall light a fire, I shall produce heat. What do you think, Agivesana? Would the man light a fire and produce heat by taking the upper fire stick and rubbing it against the wet, sappy piece of wood lying in the water? No, Master Gautama, why not? Because it is a wet, sappy piece of wood and it isn't lying in water. Eventually that man would reap only weariness and disappointment. So too, Agivesana, as to those recluses and Brahmins who still do not live bodily withdrawn from sensual pleasures and whose sensual desire, affection, infatuation, thirst and fever for sensual pleasures have not been fully abandoned and suppressed internally, even if those recluses and Brahmins feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme awakening. 
And even if those recluses and Brahmins do not feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme awakening. This was the first simile that occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. So here, what the Buddha-to-be is saying is that he starts he's seeing the danger of sensuality for the first time. Remember that in, uh, I, when he was a layperson, he was always seeing the danger in death. He had some understanding of the danger in attaching to the worldly things. And when we talk about sensual pleasures and sensual indulgence, uh, an important part of that is just the idea of ownership, of having uh, sensual objects in the world. Yeah? It's like having a house and having a car and having all these things in life. This is Part, very important part of what the Buddha is referring to here. And then all the desires that arise as a consequence of that. Yeah, because you're attached to these things, you desire them. Yeah, and, and including, of course, our relationships as well. All of that is packaged together here in sensual pleasures. Yeah, and the sensual objects. Sensual objects, sensual pleasures are meant by this word karma in Pali. Often karma is understood to mean sensual desire, but also it refers to all the objects in the world, because these, the desire and the objects go together as one kind of thing almost. Uh, they have to kind of come together. Yeah. So, uh, he, uh, so this is what he is now starting to understand, the danger of this. Now he is getting it fully, and he understands that it is impossible to reach awakening and to have real insight into the nature of reality as long as you have some desire for these things. And why, why is that the case? Why is it impossible? Yeah, people would like to have their fun, and they would also like to be awakened at the same time. We want both, yeah. Why do we have to give anything up? We don't want to give things up. Actually, the Buddha, in the end, you're not giving up anything at all. Yeah, What you're doing is you are giving up something that ultimately you will see as suffering, and you're just gaining another happiness, but it's far better. So actually, there isn't really, you're not giving up anything. This is a misunderstanding that you want to have both kinds of happinesses, because one of them is not really happiness at all. It is more like a, a lack of insight into the nature of reality. But the reason why you have to give it up to gain awakening is because uh, as long as you have uh, an attachment to those things, uh, you have a vested interest there. Yeah, You have a vested interest, in other words, because you are attached to them, you will see them in a certain way. Yeah? You will see them through the eyes of a vested interest, which is a delusion, uh, which is the wrong way of understanding them. Uh. So as long as the attachment is there, as long as the sensual desire hasn't been completely let go of, it's impossible to see things in a neutral way. You have to see things neutrally to be able to get insight. If you have a vested interest, you cannot see things neutrally. You cannot see them as they actually are. Why? Because your mind distorts that. That is what vested interest means. That is why, uh, you know, if you, uh, th this, is, this is the reason why that you have so much, uh, uh, you know, a, a company that, for example, ha has a, uh, you know, a vested interest in a, a certain product uh, will not be able to see their own business in a neutral way. That's why the government has to regulate businesses, uh, otherwise they will just see things through their own vested interest. Uh, so you have to stand back and you have to let go of these things, and only then is the mind stable. It is without vested interest and it can see things clearly. You have to be above these things. Uh, and this is why you have to abandon these things. Yeah? And this is one of the reasons why samadhi is so important, because actually when you reach samadhi, that is where you abandon uh, the vested interest in the sensual world. This is what the Buddha-to-be is understanding here. Yeah? Yeah? Then now you can see things clearly here. Yeah? So, uh, he says here that uh, without these things being abandoned and suppressed internally. The word suppressed is not a very good translation. Uh, the Pali word is supatisado. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Su Supati pasado, okay, so pasada means like calmed, yeah, or tranquilized. So it doesn't really mean suppressed. Suppression has the sense of using force, holding things down. That's not actually what it means. It means that it has been calmed or tranquilized. You have tranquilized this sensual pleasure. Uh, it doesn't uh, lead you to any excitement and agitation anymore. It's all gone, it's disappeared. 
That's important to understand because uh, we don't overcome sensuality through suppression. Uh, you overcome it by finding a more profound happiness somewhere else. Uh, you overcome it by letting go because you understand the danger and the dukkha. That is how you overcome it. Uh, yeah, and uh, when you do that in the right way, it is actually very natural and very easy. Instead of being something that where you use willpower and you use force to to get rid of these things, which sounds to, sounds like is the case when you use suppression. So it's not an ideal translation here. And then he, the Buddha says, whether you uh, feel all these painful, racking, piercing feelings. In other words, whether you practice all these ascetic practices and self-mortification or you don't practice that, it's irrelevant. As long as you have sensual desire, you're not going to be able to uh, reach awakening here. So what that means is that he hasn't he hasn't yet understood the problem with ascetic practices. That comes later. Yeah? That he obviously hasn't got that yet, but now he's seeing one side of the problem. He's seeing the problem with the sensuality. Later on he will also focus on the problem with the too strict ascetic practices. But that hasn't hap happened yet. Uh, so this first simile here is, is when they are not bodily withdrawn. And uh, bodily withdrawn, this is uh, also called kaya viveka in Pali. So the first aspect, if you want to withdraw from sensual pleasures, uh, is to withdraw physically. Yeah. Yeah, and this is why, uh, ideally, you have monastics living in the forest. Uh, this is why when you go on retreat, sometimes you go to places far away in the forest. Uh, yeah? Liter if you go all the way to Jana Grove, you literally go far away to, <laughs> to take part in this. But a place like Jana Grove is very good for meditation practice because it is secluded. It's in the forest. You are almost like halfway house to becoming a monastic when you stay at Jana Grove. Yeah? Because you are secluded, you keep the eight precepts, you are, have a nice environment and all of that. So um, it's, it's very suitable in that sense. This is the first aspect of seclusion, Kaya Viveka. It is not enough with Kaya Viveka, but it's the first aspect. And this is why forest lodgings for monastics are so important, and why the forest tradition uh, around the world, whether it is in uh, Australia or more in traditional Buddhist countries, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Burma, why this is such an important part of, that, of the Buddhist tradition in those countries, because they allow for this thing to happen. They allow you to overcome these problems in meditation practice. So this was the first simile that occurred to him spontaneously, never heard before. Yeah? He's now starting to gain insight that nobody else really has. And he hasn't actually got this from someone else. He is now uh, on, on his own and learning, learning the Dhamma firsthand through his own experience. Again, Agivesana, a second simile occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. Suppose there were a wet, sappy piece of wood lying on dry land, not far, far from water rather. And a man came with an upper fire stick, thinking, I shall light a fire, I shall produce heat. What do you think, Agivesana? Could the man light a fire and produce heat by taking the upper fire stick and rubbing it against the wet, sappy piece of wood lying on dry land far from water? No, Master Gautama, why not? Because it is a wet, sappy piece of wood. Even though it is lying on dry land far from water, eventually the man would reap only weariness and disappointment. So too, Agivesana, as to those recluses and Brahmins who live bodily withdrawn from sensual pleasures, yeah, you're living in the forest or somewhere far away, but whose sensual desire, affection, infatuation, thirst and fever for sensual pleasure has not been fully abandoned and uh, uh, stilled or uh, calmed internally, uh, even if those recluses and Brahmins feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision. This is jnana dasana and supreme awakening. Uh, and even if those recluses, good recluses and Ramas do not feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme awakening. Uh, this was the second simile that occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. So this is, you are living in the forest, but you're still thinking about all the pleasures of the world. Yeah? 
you're thinking, oh, you know, why am I enduring all this suffering in the forest? I can enjoy my, a nice car and have a nice wife or, or whatever. You, you think like that. And of course, if you think like that, then you're not going to be able to attain because you're still immersed in sensuality mentally, even though you are physically withdrawn. Yeah, and this is the problem here. Yeah. So in Buddhism, we have these two, uh, two things of seclusion, the Kaya Viveka and the Chitta Viveka. Yeah. And the Kaya Viveka always comes first. You withdraw yourself physically. You go away from the sensual pleasures of the world. Yeah. And from that, uh, next step is then the Chitta Viveka. So you move away from all of the things in the world that remind you of sensuality. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know this is what cities are like. Cities are places of sensuality. A city is a place where you enjoy yourself with entertainments, where you go out with your, uh, you know, girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. That's where you meet up and then you entertain yourself and you eat nice food and you look around and there's all these commercials everywhere that remind you of the all the sensual pleasures in the world. Uh, so the cities are places for sensuality. Uh, the forest is the opposite. So you start with just withdrawing from that because when you have less input of sensuality, that allows the mind then to kind of dry out of that sensuality and allows it to calm down gradually. When you're always reminded of it, it's very hard to withdraw properly. This is why the forest uh, abiding is so important. And it's a gradual training in allowing the mind to withdraw from these things. So this is the significance of this, and this is what the Buddha says, the Buddha Tibi says in the last simile here. Again, Agivesana, a third simile occurred to me, spontaneously never heard before. Suppose there were a dry, sapless piece of wood lying on dry land, far from water. Yes, you're far away from the water, the water is the sensual realm, the dry land is the forest, so you're far away from the sensual realm, and a man but now the piece of wood is dry, yeah, it's not wet, so it has given up that all that sensual uh, uh, sneha is the is the is the um, sap here, uh, and, and, and sneha is actually a, uh, an alternative word for craving in the suttas. Uh. And the man came with an upper fire stick, thinking, "I shall light a fire, I shall produce heat." What do you think, Agivesana? Could that man light a fire and produce heat? by rubbing it against the dry sapled piece of wood lying on dry land far from water. Yes, Master Gautama, why so? Because it is a dry sapless piece of wood and it is lying on dry land far from water. So too, Agivesana, as to those recluses and Brahmins who live bodily withdrawn from sensual pleasure and whose sensual desire, affection, infatuation, thirst and fever for sensual pleasure has, has been fully abandoned and suppressed internally, even if those good recluse and Brahmins feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are capable of knowledge and vision, nanadasana and supreme awakening. And even if those good recluse and Ramas do not feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are capable of knowledge and vision and supreme of awakening. Uh, this was the third simile that occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. These are the three similes that occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. So, uh, that is the Buddha's turning away from sensuality. He has got half it half right. He hasn't got it fully right yet, but gradually you can see him moving towards awakening through his own wisdom, through his own understanding. So, before this uh, sitting becomes uh, Atta Kalamatanu Yoga for all of us, uh, let's, have a <laughs> let's have a break. Uh, and then we'll come back again in about 15 minutes, a quarter to 11. We can continue then.